Thank you. Well, um, uh, as Ron mentioned, I'm a, I'm a pediatrician. I work at Seattle Children's and at University of Washington, and um, I did my Master's of Public Health here at UW. Um, so I'm, and, and a lot of my time is spent doing research and public health research. I'm also the mom of two boys, six and nine year old, which really have um, inspired and um, continue to inspire and, and make this work very relevant to me personally and professionally. So I'm gonna start with talking about the epidemic of physical inactivity that's in our country. Um, you know, we often talk about the obesity epidemic, yeah. Um, I'll move on to the uh, next slide. We often talk about the obesity epidemic, and, and that's obviously a very important reason for people to be active. Um, but there's actually independent of obesity. So whether you're overweight or not, being active as a child and as an adult has important implications for your health and well-being. And here, um, we sort of see that, you know, how active you are as a child not only impacts your health now, health, when I say health, I mean that in the broadest sense, your physical health, your psychological health, um, and, and overall sense of well-being. And it also affects um, how confident you feel engaging in physical activity. That could affect your activity later on in life. It could affect how much joy you feel and how healthy you are to be able to continue a life of physical activity. And all of those things are gonna impact how active you are as an adult. So um, for me, uh, you know, starting at these, the, the very youngest ages, uh, I focus a lot of my work on the early childhood years, the uh, three, four, and five-year-olds is, is critical for um, their health status now and, and really for the rest of their lives. Um, Ron alluded to this a little bit. I mean, why are children, why are we all um, less active than, than maybe previous generations? Well, there have been dramatic changes to our, our landscape. Very few of us live in places like this or children that can kind of run around through hills and fields. And um, we're either living in suburban areas that were designed for cars and don't give us very many places to walk to or parks to play in, um, or we live in urban areas that um, may not have safe sidewalks or um, places where our family feels safe sending our children to go play and spend time. Arguably, there's also been changes in our lifestyles and, and um, what children do with their time. Um, they may spend a lot of time shuttling from place to place, and I think parents' work requirements and um, time that they're not with children certainly affects um, what children do in their time. There's the ever-present screen time from the youngest ages of, you know, um, and, and in all different forms. Um, there are a lot of structured activities that children are getting into from younger and younger ages. And of course, the academic pressures. And, and um, as I mentioned, I work in the preschool age. And um, what we've seen happen to school-age children where cutting recess and PE, um, even though we know with convincing research that, the, that that does not boost test scores, um, sadly, our early childhood educators are feeling the same pressure to um, sort of cut play time to focus on kindergarten readiness and, and um, early learning from, from that standpoint. Um, one study I did a few years ago, we, we looked at nationally representative data, so over 8,000 um, parents of preschoolers, so four and five year olds, were asked, how often do you take your child to play outdoors? So again, these are preschoolers, and um, the, the highest bar there, 41% said few times a week, and um, you know, if you add up the few times a month and rarely and not at all, um, you, you easily get above half. So um, less than half of parents of preschoolers themselves are taking their preschooler to play outside every day. Not surprising, I'm not with my preschooler at this moment in time, and, and lots of other parents are not with their child during their peak awake daytime hours that um, they can take them outside. So um, I think that we have to rely a lot on other, other adults and other um, settings where children spend time. Um, and that's become my focus in the last several years. The majority of children in this age group spend considerable time, at, you know, not, not in the care of their parents. Um, some of the research I've done and others have done has shown that a lot of that time is sedentary, sadly, and um, our states have some, our policies have room to improve as far as getting kids more active. We looked at a survey of Washington State a few years ago and found that while most child care centers and home met the minimum standards, um, less than a quarter met best practices as far as physical activity and outdoor time. And outdoor time is really important. It's one of the most consistent um, correlates of physical activity and certainly all of the other benefits of being outdoors and in nature for children. 
Um, some of my work involves putting activity meters to measure how much kids are, how much their hips are moving, and that tells us how active they are. And um, GPS devices that they happily wear tell us if they're indoors and outdoors, and we can see where they're active and how active they're getting. And one study we did, we found that in childcare, um, when you add up their nap time and their not active play time, 88% of their day was um, not an opportunity for physical activity. And these things are having an impact on children's health and well-being. Um, and certainly, as we think about what early learning is and what really learning is for all children, um, it's become my interest and, and focus in thinking about um, how physical activity can play a role in, in children's overall health and learning and throughout their, throughout their years. And I will stop there. Thank you. I'd like to talk to you about our efforts in the Duwamish Valley, focusing on bringing scientific evidence <clears throat> to policy making, engaging the community, and for the longer term goals of community health. This is an aerial view, sort of uh, blocked by the light, but looking towards South Seattle, the mouth of the Duwamish River. The Duwamish River is part of an 86 mile long river that, ex that reaches down from the Cascade Crest. The area is heavily industrialized. The Duwamish Valley is Seattle's largest industrial district. There are residential communities within the industrial district and surrounding it. This is South Park here in the foreground. The residents of South Park live by the river and play by the river. <clears throat> the river is also the home, historic, and treaty guaranteed to three local tribes. Oh, magic and including one of which, the Muckleshoot tribe, which offer, operates a commercial salmon fishery. And just to let you know, it's okay to eat the salmon from the river because they only spend a little bit of their life there. And they're usually not eating at that point. Most of the river, however, is unsafe. The resident fish and shellfish are unsafe to eat even one. And there are advisory signs in multiple languages up and down the river. Yet, people continue to fish. So in 2001, the US EPA declared the Lower Duwamish Waterway a Superfund site, one of the most contaminated sites in the country after decades of urban and industrial pollution. More than 10 years later, they came up with a proposed plan, and we decided to add information to the considerations about the proposed and selecting the final plan by conducting a health impact assessment. Now, that just to, to give you some understanding about the river, because it becomes important, is that the, the Superfund site is five and a half miles long. <clears throat> you can see these small areas marked in blue. Those are sites of early actions, early cleanups that have already occurred. Those in total will remove about half of the health risk. The chemicals are associated with about half of the health risk. The extended cleanup that's projected to start in the next couple of years and to take seven plus 10 years to complete is estimated to remove another 40%, but still leaving 10% of the risk. It will still be unsafe to eat fish and shellfish out of the river, other than occasionally. So EPA plans to rely on what they call institutional controls, which are largely social controls, which are information and advisories, don't eat the fish. With our health impact assessment, we wanted to look at what were the unanticipated consequences of the cleanup Knowing that it's intended to be healthful, are there unhealthful things that we could anticipate and plan around? We focused on four vulnerable populations, community residents, subsistence fishers, the affected tribes, and workers in local industry. Now a health impact assessment simply is a systematic approach <clears throat> to collecting and evaluating information so that you can generate evidence-based and health-informed recommendations for decision makers usually focus on a proposed policy or activity or program. It has six conventional stages, but more importantly, it has a set of guiding principles, particularly democratic engagement of the stakeholders, equity, attention to equity in the assessment, sustainability, ethics, and, and then most importantly, taking a broad approach to health, go, looking beyond cancer. I'm not going to talk about this part of it. I'll put it up just to let you know we did look at short and long-term effects, such as effects related to the construction and things like gentrification, job creation, and job loss. We spent most, most of what I'm going to describe relates to what EPA focused on, which is the contaminated river sediment, contaminated fish. If you eat the fish, 
what is your risk of getting cancer? We looked more at these other domains. So for example, with non-tribal fishers, we address questions like who is currently fishing? Why are they fishing? And what is the likelihood that they would or would not experience effects related to chemical exposure, changes in food and nutritional security, and social changes? We used a variety of existing information. The most important resource, though, was our graduate student who did most of the work, and the heavy reliance on community advisors and focus groups. This I just put up and I obscure the fine points because I want you to know it's quite a challenge to distill all this information because when we're not doing risk assessments, you don't end up with numbers you can add and multiply together. You end up with apples and oranges. We had a very systematic process to put this together and to come up with recommendations, such as for the fishers, one is that institutional controls need to go beyond just restrictions and in information. They need to emphasize positive alternatives. It's not enough to tell people not to fish. It's more to tell them what they should do. There is a need for out-of-the-box thinking. We gave some ideas. And that it needs to be culturally appropriate and sensitive, and that the evidence supports approaches that we described for them. We put this together in a package of recommendations, separated out for different par uh, parts of dis different decision-making bodies, and this is where we are now. I'll leave this as a teaser as I close. These are the kinds of things you might say, so what, what happens next? And what kinds of things are we working on now? That's it. So, thank you very much. So um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about creating healthy regional s communities through food systems. And I think most of you would agree with the statement or the spirit of the statement that we value our food and that we expect our food system to produce what we need now and for generations to come. So I think it will shock most of you to find out that despite that statement, we waste about 40% of the food we produce, almost all of it edible. So almost half of the food that we produce we're wasting. <clears throat> and what I want to do today is talk to you about three points and uh, some of the work we're doing here to, to, to help solve this problem. So point one is the scale. The scale of the problem is massive. And just to give you uh, some relation to this is one day of food waste in the U.S. could fill the Husky Stadium about 1.3 times, most of it edible. The face value costs of the problem are enormous. So you see here food wasted in America yearly costs $161 billion as compared to what we might spend on food stamps, which in 2014 was 74 billion. And you can see how this compares to other budgets. Um, and this doesn't even account for the natural resources that we're losing when we waste food that also attribute to these costs. So that's not, not even a, a revealed here in this particular cost. So point two, that brings me to point two, which is that food waste has in profound environmental consequences and wastes our human labor too. So what you see here is that 40% of the food waste means that we're wasting our fresh water, our energy, and our land. And when we throw it in our landfills versus in the compost, we're also creating more methane emissions, which contributes to climate change. We also waste human labor, but I don't actually have a number to show you the scale of the human labor that's wasted in doing this. Point three, food waste is not just a personal problem. It's also a problem because of hunger. Last year, 43 million Americans were on food stamps. 43 million Americans were on food stamps. And reducing food losses by just 15% would be enough to feed over half of those on food stamps, or about 25 million people every year. So it's an unbelievable opportunity to do something. Consumers are the biggest source of edible food waste. Don't be scared of the slide. The black boxes on the left are uh, stages in the food system from the farm to processing all the way to consumer. And on the right side, you see uh, food waste by food group. And what you see here is that consumers are the biggest source of food, food loss, followed by agriculture at the farm and, uh, and by retail losses. <coughs> There are some challenges with fixing this problem. Um, we don't have common metrics. Despite all the numbers I've shown you, those are very large national numbers. We don't know what's going on within communities or at a smaller scale. There are ripple effects and trade-offs. If we were to give people smaller portions, we would have more packaging waste, for instance. Um, we also don't have a very good hold over what an evidence-based or system-level solution would look like for this problem. So what are we doing about it? We uh, have this wonderful opportunity right now, actually. We're working with the city of Seattle and Seattle Public Utilities to understand this problem. We're looking at it at a systems level. And city of Seattle is really on the leading edge of this. We've been trying to reach out to public agencies to find out what others are doing. And everyone says, 
no one's ever asked us that before and we're not doing anything. So we really look forward to hearing what Seattle is going to do about this problem. Uh, we're also working with commercial and anti-hunger sectors because we have very great uh, and and um, we appreciate that the, the knowledge that's being shared by businesses that are local. Costco is participating, PCC is participating, and other local businesses. The approach we're taking is um, to try to re reduce food waste from a, a hierarchy. And the two the two topics that we're really focusing on are the source reduction and feeding hungry people. So we're right in the middle of the study, but I'm going to tell you some of the pre preliminary information that we found, which um, we're starting to process. And first, I'm going to start with source reduction. So uh, the businesses locally have um, some technologies that help them reduce waste. So this is a, what's up here on the left is a lean path uh, system to help them track what they're wasting and how to reduce it. And on the right is a Wyserg, and you may have seen this outside of PCC uh, to help them reduce food waste as well. And they exist, but these are expensive and they're not widespread across other commercial sector businesses. In terms of feeding hungry people, there, we, we see that there more surplus food exists than is being recovered. And this is mainly due to uh, barriers and operating support. So we hear a lot about, um, we just don't have enough staff to pick up all the food that exists that's in surplus. Um, we lack transportation, storage, refrigeration, and so on. And we also are learning it's not just about quantity, it's about food quality. And Seattle has some leading programs in this area where they're creating a farm to food bank, and they're also working with restaurants that produce healthy food to try to, to, try to recover some of the healthier food choices. But the most important thing that keeps coming up over and over and over again is that without consumer awareness and tying it to consumer awareness, it's not going to work because the commercial sector can't make, this, they can't make the advances that are needed to reduce food waste without the consumers buying in as well. And so uh, the Food Too Good to Waste is actually a campaign that King County is working on to increase consumer awareness about this problem. There's still much work to be done. We're working uh, on uh, another, the next step of the project is to define and create common metrics and uh, to, to activate progress across a, a variety of approaches in prevention, recovery, and recycling, and to create some public policy tools that might help uh, advance progress a little more rapidly. <clears throat> so in sum, food waste goals must be part of a food system that will feed future generations and help us value our food again. Thank you. <laughs>